God is going to touch us and minister to us. Father, we love you today. We praise you. We bless you. Lord, we lift up our voices to you today. And we declare there's no God like unto you. There's no rock like our rock. There's no Savior like our Savior. And Lord, we thank you today that you are a strong tower that the righteous can run in and be safe. Lord, we thank you that you are, you are, Lord God, King of kings and Lord of lords, that nothing, nothing's too hard for you and nothing takes you by surprise. Lord, I praise you today, Lord, as we worship. Lord, may it come up before you as a sweet-smelling savor. Fill this house with your glory. Touch each heart. Lord, I pray for every, every person's heart's questions to be answered today, Lord God, for things that they have mulled about and, and, and meditated upon, Lord, that it would, the word would come forth with the answers that they need today. We thank you that you're so faithful to us. And God, we praise you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness to us today. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless us. Worship. Praise the Lord.
suppose you treated that person like, well, I've got to go see him today and I really don't want to, but let's just hurry up and get it over with. It's just one of those things we've got to do. Anybody know who I'm talking about? I'm going to tell you something. That's your heart this morning. I pray God breaks it before you leave here. Because He's worthy of our praise. And it don't start when you're 18. It ought to start when you're big enough to understand who He is. That's why I love it when I see kids worship. Nobody is excluded. He's worthy. We don't have to be here today. We get to be here today. It is an honor and a high privilege to come into the courts of the Most High God. Wow. It's an honor. So let's treat it as such. Amen? Man, I, I would hope no one in this place, no one in this place, let's suppose... Let's suppose Jesus himself walked in here today and chose somebody to go to dinner with. I can't imagine anybody going to dinner with Jesus today and saying, can we hurry up and get this over with Jesus? In fact, I don't want to go to no nice restaurant. Let's just go to the drive-thru so we can wolf it down and hurry up and get out of here. Wow. I don't think so. I think we probably picked the nicest restaurant we could find with the slowest servant and just say, Jesus, let's just make this last. Let's do one of them power lunches like two hours, three hours. So we're going to sing this one more time. And I want you to worship like you're happy to be here and like he's worthy to receive it and like you're really thankful. Amen. You didn't just tear yourself away from your latest, greatest Christmas gift or whatever it was just to come for a few or whatever. you got to get back to that. But no, you come into the presence of the courts of the King of the Most High. I was driving down the road yesterday afternoon. And I was praying and worshiping. And all of a sudden, the presence of God just flooded the car. I was driving by myself. And I just like was overcome by his presence. I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you. That's the greatest present I could ever receive this Christmas season is your presence. Hallelujah. And it is. There's nothing, there's nothing worth trading that for. Nothing. Because guess what? Nothing else is going to last. Everything you have on this earth someday is going to burn up. I was thinking about that this morning. It says the earth and the works that are therein. All of it. Peter says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness? It says the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise and the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. It's the exact description of a nuclear explosion. I'm not trying to scare the proverbial pants off of you. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. I'm just telling you that we never know when this will be the last Sunday we ever get to meet. Either because of whatever or because we're in an eternity. We all look healthy today, but guess what? Not a one of us is guaranteed tomorrow. We don't have that banking guarantee. So if this is the last Sunday I've ever found in the house of God alive, I want it to be a Sunday where I'm giving Him hello. Not lip service, but from my heart. Amen. Come on, let's try it one more time. You deserve the glory and the honor. Oh Lord, we lift our hands and worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands and worship. As we lift your holy name, for you are great, and you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you, for you are great, and you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you, for you are great, and you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. Oh,
Come on, give Jesus a big hand of praise today. Can you do that, Lord? We love you. We adore you. We exalt you. We know you're still a miracle-working God. Father, would you just let your healing virtue extend to everyone who couldn't make it today, the sick, those that are traveling, Lord God. And I know we didn't call them all. There's some in Wyoming. God bless and touch them as well. And Father, that you would just help us, Lord God, today to put you first and love you most. As we hear Pastor Stacy say all the time, Lord, I pray today that you would just touch us anew and you. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Welcome today. Thank you for finding yourself in the house of God on the very last Sunday of 2019. Take a moment, greet someone. God bless. you can get your donation in for this year and uh, I know that's not your number one reason for giving but as long as it's still tax deductible amen take that advantage and uh, thank you for your giving in advance you know our theme for 2020 is to see him more clearly and uh, I don't think I've ever really stopped to think what does 2020 mean so, I asked the all-knowing Google yesterday. How many know Google's supposed to be all-knowing? At least many people must think it is. And, you know, the big joke some days probably will find there's a couple of people sitting in their basement in their pajamas or underwear adding all these answers, and we all just take it for granted. Hopefully not, just a little humor. But I found like this. 2020 means that you see things clearly with both eyes at 20 feet. Now I found out something else. You can wear glasses and still have 20 20 vision. Isn't that interesting? You can have better than 20 20 vision. You might have 20 10, which means one eye is even more a student in the average, but it's based on an average. What the average person sees from 20 feet, that's 2020, if you see clearly at 2020. So, how many didn't know if you had glasses, you'd still be determined as 2020? Hmm, me neither. But as we move into this next year, we want to see things clearly, amen? We, we, don't, want, we don't want something hidden. To, to, to bite us. We don't want something hidden to ambush us. We want to see clearly and we want to follow the vision that God has put out and set forth for our lives because that's how we'll be successful. That's how we'll be successful. You've heard me say many times and it's so true. 
Don't just ask God to bless what you're doing, but find out what God is doing and do it, and it'll all right, automatically be blessed. Amen? I don't want to force something. I want to make sure that what I'm following and what I'm pursuing is what God is indeed wanting. Because guess what? As we say also, his will, his bill. My will, my bill. How many know you can get in a whole lot of trouble doing your will? You can get in a whole lot of, you know, life it, it has enough difficulties without you magnifying them. And you can make choices that literally cause you grief for years to come. And so you want to you wanna be able to see clearly those pitfalls. You want to be able to see clearly those things that, that uh, you know, I know a few years back, like several years ago, my wife and I were praying about a, a certain uh, situation and, and whether we should be involved in it. And we both felt a check. And I'm so glad we listened to the Holy Spirit because someone else bought what we were looking at. And as soon as they did, all these cans of worms opened up and they had tens of thousands of dollars of stuff that they had to do that it would have been ours to do had we been in that situation. And so never, ever, never, ever ignore that check of the Holy Spirit, that uneasiness of the Spirit. You know, it's not just fear, okay? How many know it's, it's not fear to have wisdom? You know, I don't, I'm not afraid of my stove, okay? I, I like my stove, though I don't use it. My wife uses it and does a very good job. Okay, so she tells me, you stay out of the kitchen, I'll do the cooking, I'm only so happy. But I don't, I'm not afraid of my stove, but I don't rest my hand on the burner. Does anybody get the, hello? You see, just because you don't want to rush into something doesn't mean you're afraid or you're acting in fear. There's wisdom. I'm not afraid of the highway, but I don't play in it. Is anybody, are you hearing what I'm saying? There's plenty of things in life that I don't have to be involved in that doesn't mean that I'm operating out of fear because there's wisdom that keeps me from doing certain things. Amen? And so as we go into 2020, we want to have that right vision, that vision that we're not operating out of fear, but we're not ignoring the checks of the Holy Spirit. We're seeing clearly what's down the road in front of us. So thank you as you give, and as you give, God's going to make all of those things possible because we covenant with him, and he's promised to rebuke the devourer over our lives. Father, we love you today. Thank you for your love to us. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, as we close another year, your faithfulness to us, how you've provided and you've met every need, and you've helped us, Lord, at every turn, and we thank you for it. Now, God, today as we further that covenant by giving back a portion of that which you blessed us with. We thank you that it'll be multiplied and it'll go from this place to its intended uses and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. Thank you as you give. Let's worship.
Bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. Praise team. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I trust everyone had a 
good Christmas and good time with your family and a chance to rest from work and uh, it's just hard to wrap my brain around the the numbers 2020 that's, that's like I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just me, but it's like this 2020 thing. Instead of a, a just entering a new decade, it almost seems like a new century for some reason. That to just say 2020 sounds like so much more. Uh, but indeed, we're on the verge of the year 2020. And as we close this year, there's things that. We not only need to take with us from 2019, but some things we need to leave behind. And if we're going to be successful, we've got to learn to know what to let go of and what to hold on to. And so that brings me to the title of my message today, which is in and of itself seems to be a oxymoron. And an oxymoron that's not your third cousin. An oxymoron, now just, just a little humor, stay with me. Uh, an oxymoron is two terms that do not go together, like cheap doctor, honest politician, um, cheap lawyer, little giant, that works. Anything like anything that's conflicting is like an oxymoron. And so the title of the message today in many ways is like an oxymoron, but I go back to what I just said. It literally is. In fact, all of life is the art of knowing what to turn loose of and knowing what to hold on to. My wife and I uh, kind of just, uh, I don't know if hold up is the proper terminology, but we kind of just, we didn't go anywhere Christmas Day because Obviously, our parents are all deceased and our kids we celebrated with the day before, so there's nowhere to go on Christmas Day. And uh, we found ourselves watching the History Channel, and there was a long series about the men who built America. And after it was the food that, that, that made America, and it was fascinating. The things that people went through and the things that they didn't turn loose of that they should have, and vice versa. And uh, the men who literally carved out the future of America, you could pretty much count on one hand. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, uh, the Vanderbilts, uh, these were men of influence and wealth beyond our wildest imagination. When you run the numbers, in fact, Andrew Carnegie sold out his, his interest. And in that day, it sold for like 480 million dollars and they were saying how many billions that would be translated into today and when he received that money he became the richest man in the world and that had been his goal for some time and it kept eluding him and and it was fascinating to see all of this how it came about the the, the railroads and the commerce and the the oil refineries and all of the things that we just take for granted today that people actually dug out of the scrabble of earth of this land we call the United States that, that went behind the scenes and, and built the factories and, and uh, then the food that made America. The, Mr. Hershey who built a factory in Pennsylvania uh, which na later the town would be named after, after his, his name but it was, it was literally just an open field just, just for cows. It was just farmland. It was near Derry, Pennsylvania, D-E-R-R-Y. And 
all of the struggles and how that he literally was putting the smokestack on the chimney of the factory and finalizing the building of the factory and still did not yet have the formula for Hershey's chocolate down. He hired a salesman to sell Hershey chocolate. And he said, I want you to come work for me. And he said, uh, and the, the guy looked across the table at him. He said, well, what are we selling? He said, well, we don't have it yet. He said, well, let me get this straight. You're hiring me to sell something you don't have. He said, that's right. He said, you have a problem? He said, no. He said, that's fine. <laughs> and literally just as they were putting the smokestack on the factory, finishing it up, he broke through. He broke through the discovery of how to get the perfect formula. And Mr. Hershey actually built a town for his workers. And he tried to make it nice and all the things that he went through. But he essentially lived the life pretty much of a hermit. He didn't have family. And still to this day, Hershey's milk chocolate goes to help orphans. He built a boy's home, and much of his fortune was given away and still today. So let me just tell you, just go eat some Hershey chocolate today and don't feel guilty. Blessings upon you from the pastor. But it's amazing. And then Mr. Kellogg and all that he went through and how Kellogg's cornflakes actually came about because a batch of granola was left out overnight and they were afraid that it had spoiled and they, it created a different texture that was just a tiny bit on the fermented side but still safe to eat. And then the giant rollers that were they're invented to roll this stuff out and all that that we take for granted today when we just open the box and shake in the bowl. All that happened... And the many things they went through and all of the, 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 the turmoil of, you know, we think sometimes, well, if we just had more money, we'd be happy. I'm going to tell you something. When this guy finally got it all, when he was the richest man of the world, his life was still empty. It didn't, it didn't like, it didn't bring the satisfaction he thought it would bring. It was still empty. And the people that couldn't, couldn't let go of things and, the Kellogg brothers who carried on a running quarrel their whole life. The one who was a doctor who had a kind of like a sanitarium where people would go for their health and uh, mentally and physically. And he thought that his brother was just a dummy and he was always talking down to him and belittling him. And it was the doctor that had, that had invented the, granola but he wouldn't do anything with it and his brother kept telling him we could sell this across the whole country and you'd have plenty of money to help more people and 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 his brother just kept belittling him and telling him you know you're you're too stupid to do that and who do you think you are and the only reason you have a job is because i'm good enough to let you work here and out of tragedy came triumph because mr kellogg dr kellogg's sanitarium burned to the ground and in the burning of the sanitarium it freed his brother to have the courage to start Kellogg's cornflakes we've got to learn sometimes that God's doing things we have no idea why we're along for the ride we got to know what to let go of and what to hold on to and so today, though it seems like a contradiction, forget and remember. As we get into this today, I hope you don't forget this message. And, you know, there really is no sense. And I have to keep telling myself this. Listen, I'm preaching to me too. I have to keep reminding myself that there's no earthly benefit nor 
spiritual benefit for me to hold on to things I cannot change and to keep rehearsing it, trying to come up with a different answer of why it went down this way. At some point, I must just resign myself that this is life. I can't control everything. I don't know all the whys. I don't have all the answers. Not only do I not have all the answers, I don't even have all the questions. And really, I think a lot of times... It's not so much that we don't have all the answers is we're not even asking the right questions to get the right answers. How many understand if you don't ask the right question, it is impossible to get the right answer. I think our whole thought process gets messed up when we think this is the only way. I know when I was working for the government, it was a seven, seven story building. Langley headquarters in McLean, and I'm not divulging any top secret. Anybody knows it can count stories, so their peace be multiplied. But that was many, many years ago. But they started me out as a in-house courier, and that's just carrying material from floor to floor to different offices, and then later all over the greater Washington, D.C. area. And the person that, quote, unquote, trained me, trained me based on how they had been trained, based on how they had been trained, based on how they had been trained. And I wasn't too long into the job when I had been released to do it on my own that I just, I realized the way that it was being done was just crazy. It just didn't make sense. And you would start out on the ground floor and your first delivery would be on the ground floor on the far extreme end of the building and then your next delivery was on the far extreme end of the other building on the second floor then your next delivery might be on the far extreme end of the building on the fourth floor on the other end and you literally just back and forth back and forth walking down all these long corridors of this huge building and so I decided this I'm going to do everything on the B corridor side from ground floor up to the, to the top. Then I'm going to walk across and I'm going to go down FG corridor, the elevator down to the bottom because it's easier to go straight up over and straight down than it is to keep doing this. I literally cut the time of delivery and the time of work down by a half an hour to 40 minutes and I was called in the office by the supervisor to ask if I had done my run because he could not believe I was back already and he would not take my word he actually got on the phone and called every office that I was supposed to visit and every office said yes he's been here he's, he's already been here yes and I'm just saying, you know, that's not to toot my horn, but I'm trying to just say how much have we accepted over the years just because that's the way it's been handed down to us. We've put our brain on the shelf and we've just accepted it as the norm. And God has something different he wants to show you, but you can't get it until you let go of what you've been holding on to. And, and, you know, the sad thing, you know, this was a carnal, heathen environment. The sad thing was I was not commended for thinking a better, inventing a better mousetrap, so to speak. I was looked upon with disgust, and they were irritated that I got my job done quicker. Maybe that's, I guess, if you, if you work for the government, you're not supposed to do anything real fast. I guess I just didn't realize that at the time. Hello. I didn't realize common sense is the enemy of the people. Hello. But there are some things in life which you're literally, guess what? If you don't forget it and let it go, okay? And I realize sometimes it's really hard to forget. How many know sometimes it's hard to forget? It's hard to forget. But it is possible that it just doesn't come to mind all the time. Joseph, all the mess he went through. All the mess he went through, when he finally got married and he had his first kid, he named him Manasseh. God has chosen, has caused me to forget. That's what Manasseh means. 
You know, isn't it amazing how everybody's kid back then, their name had a meaning of whatever their parents was going through or whatever was going down in their life. Manasseh, God hath caused me to forget. So I'm literally telling you there's some things that you're going to have to let go of that may have happened in this last decade to be successful in the decade we're getting ready to go into. To the ability, I want you to hear this. I hope if you're not taking literary notes, you're taking mental notes because it's so important. Or you later get the CD and listen to it again at your own leisure. But to the ability and to the extent that we are able to let go and forget and remember and retain and get that balance as it's supposed to be is literally going to determine whether we're successful or not. Because guess what? It is absolutely no fun to lay awake night after night after night rehearsing the same old hooey that cannot be changed. All you're doing is giving the devil extra mileage. All you're doing is shortening your life. If not literally, you're shortening the quality of life. And at the end of the day, nothing's going to be changed. It's been said hindsight is 2020. If we could all rewind the proverbial tape of life, we could all probably be millionaires or close to their, you know, if you could go back and visit every decision. In fact, wouldn't it be interesting if, if you had like a 24-hour block where you were allowed to go back and reverse every decision that had caused you grief, that had caused you financial loss? How many would like not sleeping during any of that 24 hours? You'd like drink a couple extra Mountain Dews, 14 cups of coffee, whatever your <laughs> choice of, you would, you're like, give me a toothpick for each eye. I want to get the most out of this. But the truth is we can't. But as I watched this series of the men who built America, I found out a lot of times their setbacks were set ups because they refused to quit. Sometimes because they were in competition with one another, buying out and manipulating and manipulating the stock market. And this was the day before a bunch of antitrust laws and they had created monopolies for themselves and they would try to anticipate and buy out the market. And, and, and I believe it was Andrew Carnegie who, who, who bought up some land that he really didn't want because he discovered that it had... Uh, no, actually, it, wasn't, it, it, was, it was John D. Rockefeller, I think, that bought up that land because he discovered it had iron ore on it, and Mr. Carnegie was making his fortune off steel. He was the first one to produce steel, for, and, and he was in competition with John D. Rockefeller, and, and, and they were all the time playing these hidden chess games behind the scenes trying to one-up one another and outmaneuver one another. And sometimes it looked like they were trapped and they were at their end, but they simply took their setback and used it as a setup. And see, that's what the enemy of your soul is trying to do. He wants to try to get you in a series of setbacks to where you just throw up your hands and give up. Because the truth of the matter is the devil cannot defeat anybody in this building under the sound of my voice if you refuse to quit. If you'll commit your heart and life to Jesus Christ, if you'll trust in him, you cannot lose if you'll put your life in his hands. That is an absolute fact. If it were not so, none of us would be here today. Yeah, we've got people sick and we've got people traveling and out and different, but guess what? The devil wanted nobody to show up. He's wanted that every service for every church, but he's not in control. Somebody say the devil's not in control. You know, you, you, look, you can blame him for certain stuff because he deserves to be blamed. And absolutely, he gets a lot of credit for it. But at the end of the day, the devil is not more powerful than your ability to choose. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. 
2020 is not going to be different than 2019 because I already made my decision to follow Jesus 42 years ago. Somebody shout yes. What happens in 2020 is not going to be predicated upon whether I've chosen to quit or go another way. It's going to be predicated upon I'm going to continue to set my face toward the heavenly goal that I started 42 years ago. And that's what you've got to get down in your spirit. Nothing, nobody, there's nobody worth going to hell for. Hello? There's no amount of money worth going to hell for. You know, if you've been around here, you've, you've heard me say some things that I hope have been burned in your memory. And one of the things you'll, you'll hear me say is, stay blessable. Amen? Amen. Stay blessable. Stay blessable. How do I stay blessable? By doing the things that please God. Don't deliberately be doing things you know that God can't bless. Why do you want to do things that you know there's a curse on it, and yet you're going to do it anyway? That just doesn't even make good sense. Don't be an enabler. Can I get a witness? I'm not going to give somebody money that I know is a hopeless, drunken alcoholic, nor am I going to drive them to the front door of the ABC store. But if they're hungry and they need something to eat, I will take them to McDonald's and pay for their food or take them somewhere else and buy them some food. But I'm not, are you hearing me? I'm not going to be an enabler to people's. There comes a time when you've got to stop bailing people out of their mess because they've learned nothing. I know that sounds hard. It may sound harsh. It may sound unmerciful, but it's really not. Because when we create a dependent class, we set people up for failure. The thing about being a parasite is if your host dies, you're in trouble. Don't y'all shout me down when I'm preaching because I'm going to say that line again. The only problem about being a parasite is if your host dies, you're in trouble. So, Philippians chapter 3 says, Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul is writing this as one who has experienced prison time for preaching the gospel. Imagine that. Now you could be thrown in jail for something as simple as preaching. There must really be a devil. Hello? I mean, preaching seems to be kind of harmless. But it must be some people just don't like to hear the truth. Can I get a witness? Hello? You see, contrary to what a lot of people think because they haven't read history nor do they seem to care to want to, our number one grievance with, with England, our number one grie grievance and reason for wanting to break away and be independent was not taxation without representation. That was item number 17. There were 34 articles, 34 reasons that our founding fathers gave. At the top was freedom of religion. At the top was we don't want slavery. At the top when James McDonald was in the stocks in Culpeper, Virginia, in the public stocks, in those days, I don't know how many of you have been to historic Williamsburg. That's the only place I know you can even see what they look like anymore. But they have stocks out in the town square where they you had to stretch out and they put these wooden things down on them. You couldn't pull your hands. You couldn't pull your feet out. And you'd have to sit there for however long your punishment was. And people would pass by and they'd help you with your punishment by throwing rotten eggs and rotten tomatoes and they figured you needed, you deserved whatever you got, and you were free game. You couldn't scratch your nose, you couldn't scratch your ear, you couldn't, you sat there all day, however long, 
I mean, it was, it was pretty horrific. Now if you go to jail, you got color TV and hot water and showers and three meals and three hots and a cot and lawyers and a library, how to go in and read up in the law, how you can figure out how to get out of the mess. Well, maybe we need more jails like the dude out there in Arizona, Arizona who dresses his prisoners up in pink and makes them it, live in tents out in the desert. Maybe they wouldn't want to go back so quick. I'm just saying, just a thought. But Patrick Henry came riding by, and he inquired as to why James McDonald was in these stocks. James McDonald was a pastor. And you know what he found out? He was preaching without a license. The Church of England had failed to grant him a license, and they'd only granted one license for the entire region. We're talking about a day on the horseback, and, and they'd one region, hundreds and hundreds of miles, one pastor. And James McDonald had dared to answer the call of God and preach without a license. And for that, he sat in stocks in Culpeper, Virginia. That's why our founding fathers cherished liberty. That's why they fought for our freedoms. But we've been lied to, and we've been deceived, and we've been ill-informed. And dare I say it, too lazy to know the difference nor care. I'm going to tell you something. It's criminal. You can get mad if you want, but it's criminal that we're raising a generation of college kids who think socialism is wonderful. It shows their parents have failed miserably. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at yourself. Do you raise somebody to think that they can sit on their blessed assurance and take other people's God help us. Wow. Listen, news flash. Parents, you have more of a moral obligation than to just see that your kid is fed and clothed. You actually have an obligation to see that they've learned something, not been brainwashed by people of inferior intellect. Why, you paid for it. The ultimate crime of the, of the century is that we have parents working extra jobs to pay sixty and seventy and thousand dollars a year to send their children to, to, to places that will teach them to hate this country and hate them. Wake up. Your degree in psycho whatever is not worth the paper it's written on. Go out and get a real job. What are you going to do? Somebody said, well, what did your child learn at college? They learned how to protest. Show me which Fortune 500 company wants to hire your kid to be a jerk. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you the truth. If you're going to pursue a career, pursue a career that's got some future to it. That's actually going to have some benefit. Because guess what? We're finally going to run out of people to analyze. Right, look, hey. You know, I'm not called to preach what you want to hear. They did a survey not too long ago. 60% of people that went to psychiatrists got better. 70% of people who didn't go got better. I want to let that sink in. Let me say it one more time. 60% of people that went to psychiatrists got better. 70% of people that didn't go got better. In case you're having problems with math today, you have a 10% better chance if you just worked it out on your own. You could have stayed at home and talked to your cat or dog and been better off. Hello? I'm not saying there's not some times when it, 
works to talk to someone or counsel with someone. But remember this, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. 99.9% of the counsel outside the doors of this church is just that. In fact, would to God we'd all just get full of the Holy Ghost because one of his names is Counselor. Come on, somebody. You, 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 got, you got a problem? Tell it to Jesus. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, show me. A friend of mine, he, he doesn't even have a college degree, okay? I'm not downing college. I'm just telling you, it's not all about college, especially if they're teaching you nonsense. He's one of the top technicians in his, in his company. They fly him around. They take him places. They feed him steak. They feed him. He has an expense account. He doesn't buy junk. I mean, he eats well. He's paid well. He says, the funniest thing about this job, Brother Steve, is I don't have a degree. And I don't have all the college teaching that these other people have. He said, but I walk in and I stand in front of the machine. And I say, Holy Spirit, what's wrong with this? Show me what's wrong. And he says, the Holy Spirit shows me what's wrong and I fix it. I'm like news for you. I'd rather have five seconds of Holy Ghost education than everything they're trying to cram down the throats of our kids today. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things, things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Wow, notice that. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I've got to forget and I've got to remember. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So what are some of the things I need to forget? Boy, I know this is not easy. Nobody ever said it would be. But I got news for you. It's time to stop rehearsing stuff that happened 20 years ago. There's no future in it. There's no benefit. There's no lasting help. You have to let it go. So you're going to have to forget offenses. Don't nurse it, don't curse it, don't rehearse it, and God will reverse it. Let me say it again. I'm not telling you that's easy to hear. I'm telling you if you want to be successful, you can't keep looking in life's rearview mirror till you swerve off the road and go over the proverbial ravine. Listen, I'm not oversimplistic this morning. I'm not telling you that, you know, it's just every horrific thing that ever happened to you that somehow you can just blank out your mind. I'm not talking about getting a lobotomy, but I am talking about their spiritual warfare. And the devil wants to bring that stuff up, and he wants you to dwell on it so you can't be successful. So you're going to have to double down on, Holy Spirit, help me. Jesus, I release it. Lord, put it in your sea of forgetfulness. I forgive as you've forgiven me, and move on with your life. Plotting, scheming, planning for revenge. Plotting, scheming, laying awake, hoping they get their comeuppance. Scheming, hoping that one day you can delight in their demise. It's all recipes for disaster. Because guess what? Proverbs says, don't rejoice when your enemy's in calamity, lest God sees it and frowns upon you. You better stop wishing everybody gets what they deserve lest you turn around and get what you deserve. Hello. Some will have to forget offenses. Let me say that one more time. Don't nurse it. Don't curse it. Don't rehearse it. And God will reverse it. So I've got to let go of what I can't change. I've got to give it to God so it doesn't drag me down in the coming year. I know it's easier said than done, but he's going to help us. Can I get a witness? I said he's going to help us. But I must make the attempt to release anything that will be a stumbling block to me in the coming year. I've got to release it. 
just sitting around, you know, why, why, why? My mama babysitted very few kids when we were growing up. I guess she figured four of her own was enough. But I'll never forget, my dad had this job. He was building a house for these people. And they somehow got in a child care dilemma where they didn't have anybody to babysit their brat. And he was dumped off at our door. And I must have been not more than, I don't know, six or seven years old at the time. And I can still remember this kid like it was yesterday, and that's frightening. And that kid followed my mom around. Everything my mama said, that kid said, why, why? And I must have heard why 14,000 times. By the end of the day, at six and seven years old, I was ready to commit my first murder. <laughs> I think that was tough. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I still remember, why, why? Now, I understand. That's how kids learn. And so, you, you know, your kids got us, and we need to do that. But at six and seven, I didn't, I didn't have that perspective. I was just like, I'd had enough. Now I kind of remember now why some of them old timers just used to say, because I said so, I shut up, I'll slap you down. Yeah, <laughs> I guess they just, <laughs> I'm not saying that was right. I'm saying they'd had enough wise. <laughs> How do you think our Heavenly Father must be? Don't y'all shout me down when I'm preaching good. Why me, Lord? What have I ever done? Why, why, why? I can spend my whole life asking why. Spinning my wheels going nowhere. At some time, I'm just going to have to say, it is what it is. It's happened and I can't change it. It's life. Time and chance happens to us all. It rains on the just and the unjust. Hello. Accidents are just that. I don't think anybody plans to have an accident. If you do, that comes under insurance fraud. <laughs> Hello. I don't think anybody plans to have an accident. I'd like to have an accident today. No. Uh, let's see. At uh, 2.30, I want to have an accident Three o'clock, I want to eat. No. That's why it's called an accident. So somewhere, somewhere, I'm going to have to trust my Heavenly Father that He's got the wise taken care of. Romans 14.10 says, Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Wow. But judge us rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Okay. So remember what I said. We're going to have to stay blessable. Don't do things that will cause God to withhold the blessing. Don't do stuff that will wound your soul and make life more difficult. Can I, can I get a witness? Let me say that again. Don't do stuff that will wound your soul and make life more difficult for yourself and others around you that you love and are depending on you to do the right thing. If you do miss the mark, repent and do what you have to to get back on track. Can I get a witness? You want to open heavens over your life and family. I ever want to open heavens over this church that God may look down from heaven and bless with his presence because his presence is everything. His presence is everything. I'm not saying this to make an excuse. Crowd would be wonderful, but a crowd without his presence is just that. It's a crowd. I'd rather have the cloud than the crowd. Did you hear what I said? I'd rather have the cloud than the crowd. 
If I've got to have a focus group and I've got to have 15, 20 people read my sermon and, and take a red pen and delete the lines they don't think I should say and send it through another focus group and then 14 people stick their finger up in the air after licking it to see which way the winds of, 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 of opinion are blowing to preach, then forget it. You got the wrong boy. I'm just going to try to give what God gives and preach it and preach it straight because I fear him. I don't want to stand before him someday and hear him say, well done. So I'd rather follow the cloud than the crowd. His presence is worth everything. His presence should be our passion. Can I get a witness? The greatest Christmas present of all is his presence. So I have to release the things that will make my load heavy and my burden unbearable. The Bible says, cast your cares on him for he cares for you. Cast all your cares on him. Didn't mean we'd ever have cares. Why does it say bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ and we'd never had a burden? I got news for you. There's no such thing as trouble-free existence. You came into this world crying, and at times you're going to cry until you die. I know all of you really like to hear that. Boy, Pastor, that was wonderful. I'm so glad you let me know. That. No, but it's true. It just is true. There's things that's going to break your heart. There's things that's going to wound your spirit. There's things that's going to hurt you. So we're going to have to take it all back to him. Amen. Wherefore, seeing we all so are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin with dust so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds, for ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin." Is that what it says? Notice, lay aside every weight. Lay aside every weight. I'm trying to remember where it was right now. It, it, was, it was really funny. I can't even remember. We was on a job somewhere. It may have even been a missions trip or whatever. And uh, this guy had on this coat, and he had these pockets that they just... It was an older coat, and these pockets just kind of hung way open, real wide, like. And uh, a couple of guys started gathering up rocks, and he was busy doing something. They drop a rock in his pocket. Somebody else would come by and drop a rock in his pocket. Somebody else would come by and drop a rock in his pocket. I mean, we had that dude's, <laughs> we had that dude's coat. <laughs> about half full of rocks before he realized this coat's getting heavy. <laughs> Anybody ever think this coat's getting heavy? What am I carrying around I don't need? You know, when I come in, a lot of times I'll like, I'll take, I'll take out my wallet, I'll take out this, I'll take out my keys, I'll take it. How I many you know when you walk away from a table, it's like, whoo, wow. They've actually said that there's people that have back problems just because their wallet's so big and it's on one side. It's actually throwing their back out. So maybe one of the things you need to do for 2020 is slim down your wallet and move it to the front. <laughs> maybe, may, <laughs> just maybe. But we need to lay aside the weight. We can't carry all this mess we've been carrying. That's why the old songwriter, the hymn writer said, tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus alone. So we've got to lay aside every weight. And the sin was just so easily beset us. The word beset means to surround and attack on all sides. As I've told you before, how many know you really don't have to go looking for trouble? Trouble will come looking for you. As I've told you before also, 
There's nobody who said, you know, I got up this morning, I tried my best to sin all day, and I just couldn't sin. I just I went to bed so discouraged because I couldn't sin. I got news for you. You just don't do the right thing. Sin will find you. You just don't pray. Seek the Lord. You just don't put on your armor. Sin will find you. You can be having the most wonderful day of your life, but then you've got to get out of bed. Somebody shout yes. You can be having a wonderful time at the house, but then you've got to go fight traffic. You can be having a wonderful time. How many have ever walked into a store after somebody just had an issue with the person before you got there? And now you get the benefit. Years ago when they used to ask you smoking or non-smoking in restaurants, my wife and I went to Friendly's. You know, I just want to tell you, if you're going to name your restaurant Friendly's, I'm just saying right out the gate, if you're going to name your restaurant Friendly's, just a simple, humble word of advice, you might want to hire friendly people to work there. And uh, we weren't asked. We were just marched across to this table. And the waitress put the menus down on the table. I turned to her and I said, is this, is this the non-smoking section? I'm not lying to you. Here, here was the menus. She jerked them up off the table. She said, you eat tomatoes, don't you? And she marched us over to the other end of the restaurant. I'm looking at my wife. I said, what's smoking got to do with tomatoes? I, I lost something along the way, but I'll tell you what. She was not friendly, and she shouldn't have been working at a place called Friendly's. If you're not going to be friendly... Neither one of my wife, neither one of us, I think, deserved that that day. But, you know, we just looked at each other, what in the world? But you're going to meet all them kind of people. And I wish I could tell you that all of those people are, they're, 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 whatever's messing with them is going to expire at 12, 31, 19. But guess what? All of them is going to carry their nonsense over into, every last one of them is going to carry their mess I love the way y'all shout. Let me step over here before y'all start a Jericho march and run over me. Just so excited. But can I just tell you, you don't need to carry your mess too. Let's lay aside every weight. Let's go into 2020 with our coat pockets not full of rocks. How many think that's just a really good idea? Let's just, let's go into... I wish I could tell you that, you know, at 12, 31, 19, your family members are suddenly going to have this giant metamorphosis and they're going to become somebody other than who they are right now. Probably not going to happen. Anybody in here that's dealing with knotheads, let me turn this way just so nobody thinks if I look their way, I was thinking and implying anything. Anybody dealing with knotheads is probably still going to be dealing with knotheads when the ball drops. <laughs> Hello, can I give you some real good advice for 2020? Never wrestle with a pig because you're both going to get muddy and the pig enjoys it. Do you need me to say that one more time? Never wrestle with a pig because you're both going to get muddy and the pig enjoys it. You got to understand there's literally some people enjoy being miserable. And if you literally tell them to have a nice day, don't you tell me what kind of day to have. I'm from the resistance. I want to stay angry. I want to rage against the machine. God help us, Jesus. As C.H. Spurgeon said, some preacher's sermons lend credence to the fact the brain is not essential for human life. You meet people every day that you wonder, is anything working from the neck up? I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm just telling Does anybody, do you see those type of people? Is anything working from the neck up? Are they just walking around? (laughs) 
Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beats the air. Paul says, I'm not shadow boxing. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means after I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. What's he saying? A runner must be disciplined. You have to lay aside the stuff that will drag you down and slow you down. You don't try to climb the side of a cliff face with a 70-pound backpack, backpack. Hello? You don't run a marathon with... I just, I'll tell you what, I, I, I just... I like to fell down and hurt myself laughing so hard. I went on a bicycle trip years ago with a friend of mine on the CNO Canal. And he had this huge backpack, huge backpack. And we'd stop along the trail to, to rest and, uh, and eat a snack or something and and, you know, the, the, the whole trail, the CNO Canal from Georgetown, Washington, D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland is 180 miles. And we were going to do about 120 miles of it. We, we didn't want to go into D.C. I think we picked it up somewhere around Charlestown and rode it all the way to Cumberland, Maryland. And uh, Harper's Ferry, that's it. Thank you. Harper's Ferry is where we picked it up. My wife remembers it clearly because she dropped us off there. <laughs> But we got well into the trip, and I noticed this heavy backpack is on his back, and he's pedaling away, this heavy backpack. And we stopped, and when we stopped to rest, he took the backpack off, and when he set it down, I heard this buzzing sound. And here he packed his electric razor rechargeable. When he set it down, it turned a switch on, and his backpack's laying there going well, it was just like a two-day trip. I wasn't going to worry about shaving. And he had family-sized items of stuff and big things and this and that and everything. And I, just, I got to laughing so hard. I said, look, didn't you see the sign on here that says no motorized vehicles? I said, you're going to be arrested. you got a motor and everything. Was, but he got all upset, man. He didn't think it was funny at all. But he had pounds of stuff in that thing that was not necessary for what we were doing. And it was wearing him out. You're going to have to learn to let go of some stuff. Do we have any spiritual pack rats in the building? Shout yes. I'm just saying. Hello. Now let me get to the good part and bring it to a conclusion. So you're also going to need to remember. Amen. What am I going to remember, Pastor, all the times he's seen you through? All the prayers he's answered, somebody shout yes. All the storms of life he's brought you through and you're still standing. That's what you're going to need to remember. That's called a testimony. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Your testimony is I made it through 2019. Your testimony is I made it through that, 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 that scare of cancer. Your testimony is I made it through that family crisis. Your testimony is I made it through that. I made it through that loss of job and found a better one. Somebody praise him. You've got to remember the good things. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And forget not. How many understand forget not is the same thing as saying remember? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. Your testimony is your story of how God brought you out and brought you through. He didn't bring you this far to leave you. Can I get a witness? Amen. Being confident of this very thing that he has begun a good work in you shall perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. He's not going to stop now. He's not going to stop now. We used to sing a song a long time ago, and I'll probably maybe butcher some of the words. It's been so long ago, but it said, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. 
It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. Oh, how patient he must be. He's still working on. Look at your neighbor right now and say, I am a work in progress. <laughs> now look at him again and say, I promise not to be a piece of work. Uh oh, come on, somebody. I, 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 I promise not. One of the funniest commercials that was years ago, I can't remember all of it, but I think it was this old lady sitting in a golf cart and somebody was having a meltdown in front of her, like threw their whole bag of clubs right in the lake. And this lady says, What a piece of work. How many run into some pieces of work in here? Everybody looks straight this way, not the elbows, no, elbows in. Let us realize we're a work in progress. Amen. Wow. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I must remember all his goodness and his faithfulness. All the times he's come to my rescue, for it builds my faith for the future. Can I get a witness? And yes, there'll be some suffering along the way. Life comes with that. We can't avoid it. But the God of all grace who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. The Bible says even concerning Jesus, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. I know all of us would like a life with no problems at all, no clouds, no rain, no nothing. Can I just tell you something? I'm a sunshine freak. If I had my way, it'd be sunshine 365 around the clock. And guess what? I'd die of my own stupidity because without rain. <laughs> How many right there with me? I just wish it sunshine every day. I mean, hey, I'm, I'm a sunshine freak. I like sunshine. <laughs> you know? If I had no family, no obligations, I'd just look at the map and the, you know, probably move to Arizona, whatever place where it's 321 days out of the year, you know, no, no rain, I like sunshine. But the fact of the matter is, only the best grows. Only the best grows where the rains fall. Only the wells keep from going dry where the rain flows. So I got to be careful. I don't try to out wisdom the all wise one. So into everyone's life, a little rain must fall. But guess what? It'll keep you from being a spoiled, rotten brat. That's what I've been trying to tell you when you're raising your kids. You can't shield them from every difficult situation. They need some of those situations to learn how to cope, to know how to overcome, to know how to strategize, to know how to make correct decisions. You can't shield them from everything. If you do, you're going to raise a disaster. And at 45, they'll be coming back, knocking on your door with a whole group of disasters. And that ought to be enough to scare the jabbers out of you. I produced one disaster. They went out and met another disaster. The disasters multiplied, and now they set them a door. And I'm like, Jesus, deliver me from this hour. It's too late. The thing I feared has come upon me. Hello. I'm just, hello. Do you realize that's what parenting is? You're supposed to work yourself out of a job. They're not raised until they're producing more than they're consuming. If they're still a consumer under your roof, they're not an adult. So stop, stop trying to give them the consideration of an adult. If you want the consideration of an adult, get your own job, make your own decisions, do your own thing, and don't have any help from mama or anybody else. Somebody shout yes. So if I were you, I'd milk that crib thing as long as I can. And I'd just stay humble, say, yes, mama, yes, daddy, yes, whatever, yes. I love this. Hello. I love this life. Let somebody else have the responsibility. I'm not sure how many like that last statement, but there's no polls are taken. 
For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who man commanded the light to shine out of darkness have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Some translations may say clay pots. How many know there's some cracked pots? We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, not, but not in despair, persecuted, not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body for which we live. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us, but life in you. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving and many redound to the glory of God. And here it is. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We've got to keep the big picture in focus. I've got to look beyond my present problems to what my goal is. Amen? I'm still heading to heaven. I'm still on my way to heaven. I'm still climbing. As that one old spiritual song says, I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain. It may feel like that someday. But the truth is, I'm gaining ground. The truth is, I'm getting closer to my eternal home. The truth is, there's nothing down here worth impeding my progress for. So I'm going to forget the mess and remember the good. I'm going to lay aside the weight, and I'm going to run. Can I get a witness? Okay, so here we go, and I'm finishing up. You know, you, really, you can't run from trouble and run from every unpleasant thing. You, you just can't. And I don't like that anymore than you do, but it's the truth. There are some things you can't go around you have to go through. You can't go around it, you're going to have to go through it. But the God of all grace will keep you through it. Here we are. These are my closing verses. And I love these verses. These verses will just make you want to shout. But now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. He'll make you fireproof and water. Hallelujah. Stay with him. You'll neither wrinkle, crinkle, rust, bust, or corrode. He'll see you. He's got a manufacturer's warranty like nobody's in the business. Lo, I'm with you even to the end of the earth. I won't leave you nor forsake you. I'll be there with you. The flood's not going to drown you. The fire's not going to burn you. I'm going to see you through it all. So guess what? Maybe you can't get around what you're going through right now, so just keep going through. It'll come to pass, and you'll come out the other side better. You'll come out the other side better. And you'll even find yourself saying, though you don't like to admit it, you know, I didn't like going through that, and I don't ever go through it again, but it made me a better person, and I'm glad. It developed character in me. It caused me to appreciate Look, nobody likes to be sick, please. Nobody likes to be sick. I, I'm not crazy. I, I, nobody likes to feel bad. But can I just tell you this? If you never, ever, ever, ever had any sickness or any type of problems at all, how would you be able to appreciate? Amen. Amen. How many know you appreciate health like never before? Right after you get over your... Amen. You just really do. 
I know my mom used to run around saying, I just don't have enough hands. I just don't have enough hands. I just don't have enough hands. And she went roller skating with the kids just years ago. <laughs> Church group roller skate, fell and broke her wrist. She said, I'm not going to say that anymore. Because then she's doing everything in one hand. Wow. No, we learn to appreciate, don't we? We learn to appreciate. We learn to appreciate because we're able to compare by what we've gone through. Father, I love you today. I praise you. God, I pray this word will set us up for success. Lord, that we will make a conscious effort today to let go of the things that need to be let go of. And Lord, as we do that, you will help us just put a Manasseh over it. And we'll give you praise. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed in reverence to God for just a moment, I wonder if you just lift a hand right now and say, Pastor, I needed this word today. There's some things I know I just need to turn loose of, and I want to go into 2020 without it. I see those hands. God bless you. God bless you. More hands. God bless you. I just need to turn loose. God bless you. More hands. I just need to let it go. It's not being productive. It's not helping. It's not benefiting. It's just causing more problems. And I need God's grace today. Jesus. Maybe you're here and you'll just be honest enough to say, you know, Pastor, I'm just too quick to forget all his goodness and going into 2020. I just need to remember all the times he's been so good to me. You just put a hand up and say, I want God to know I see that. Yes. I see that. Yes. I see those hands. God bless you. I just need to be a little more grateful, a little more thankful, a little more appreciative. Stand with me all over this building. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As we do here, I'm going to ask you to meet, meet me right here. We're going to pray together. We're going to close this service today. I want to urge you to be here tonight. We're going to have a great time in the presence of God as we'll have our very last service for 2019. That'd be a great remembrance, wouldn't it? The last thing I did in 2019 on the last Sunday was be in God's house. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. <sighs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Can we just take a moment of thank him? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, sweet Lamb of God. Thank you. Fairest of 10,000, Lily of the Valley, bright and morning star. Thank you. King of glory, the altogether lovely one, the all-sufficient one, the good shepherd, the way, the truth, the life, the door, the prince of peace, the lamb of glory, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, first and last, and all that's in between. My Redeemer, my Savior, my soon-coming King, my elder brother, my counselor, my friend that sticks closer than a brother. I receive all of those attributes. How many just lift your hand and say that with me? I receive all of those attributes. Everything I need from you, Lord, you already are. I receive it all. I receive it, Jesus. I receive that you're a healer. I receive that you're a redeemer. I receive that you're a friend, your comforter, your counselor. I receive your peace. Lord, for my troubled mind, my troubled soul. Lord, for any of us in this room today that Sometimes the things of life keep us awake. God, bring peace to overworked and overwrought minds. Lord, when we've exhausted ourselves trying to figure out things in the natural, may we cry out to you and say, Holy Spirit, Counselor, come, come, 
quiet our troubled spirits. Take away our anxious moments. And let us trust. Trust in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to just tell you right now, if you're standing there and there's any unfinished business between you and God, you don't want to drag it into 2020 right now. Jesus, forgive us of any and all sin. Anything, Lord, in our lives that shouldn't be, that's displeasing to you, Lord, wash us afresh in your precious blood. Lord, let us not willfully or knowingly violate your word. Wound our spirit. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you today. Father, I pray a tremendous blessing on the families of this house. Lord, we pray that blessing and covering. Lord, everyone that comes through these doors, that covering that rests over them because of the blessing of belonging, because of the blessing of family, because of the blessing of covenant that we are in. I extend that in your name. As your servant, in Jesus' name, I bless this house. And I declare that which is blessed cannot be cursed. And you will watch over your word to perform it. I declare any spell, incantation, or work of darkness that's attempted to be practiced upon this house or anyone in it. It will be turned against the head of the one who sent it sevenfold that they may know and understand there's a greater power. In Jesus' name, we pray blessing over our country over our president, over our leaders, Lord. We pray peace over our nation. God, we pray peace over the state of Virginia, that wicked people that would try to stir up unnecessary strife, that would try to gender division and hatred, Lord, that they would be put out of a place of authority and someone that fears you would take their place. We'll love you and we'll praise you in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, God bless you. We love you. Shake some hands, hug some necks. Thank you for being in God's house and happy, happy new year to you.